So yeah, Elvis. Elvis has changed a lot since he died in 1977. I was seven at the time. And for me, that was the summer of Star Wars. We didn't really listen to Elvis the house. We didn't own any of his albums. My mom was always a bigger fan of Fabian anyway. A few of Elvis's songs would come on the radio occasionally, especially during the Wolfman Jack show. Uh, since I knew he was supposed to be the king of rock and roll, I guess maybe I attached some significance to Hound Dog or Jailhouse Rock at the time. Not enough to even ask them to turn it up when it came on. Just sort of a mental acknowledgement. I know we watched some of Elvis's movies when they'd come on the Saturday afternoon matinee, right after cartoons and creature feature. I have vague memories of Blue Hawaii and Kissin' Cousins. Nothing tangible, though. I remember one Christmas the local UHF station spelled his name Elves Presley in the bumps between sections of the movie, but I couldn't tell you what either movie was about or even who was in them except Elvis. I don't remember watching any of his televised concerts either. So in short, I knew who he was. I knew he was supposed to be good, but I knew almost nothing about him or his music. When I try and remember my impressions of his death in 1977, mostly what comes up in my mind is older women who carried a torch for him that were sad. As far as Elvis's impact on my life personally, well, that was basically it for a very long time. All through the years in which I was establishing my musical sense, Elvis really wasn't part of the picture at all. In fact, in 1988, when I graduated high school, and if you had come to me and given me the phrase king of rock, I probably would have come up with Run DMC, not Elvis. But of course, Quentin Tarantino happened, and David Lynch happened, and the 1950s early rockabilly aesthetic began to pick up traction. And there was Chris Isaac and Mojo Nixon and Brian Setzer. And the notion of Elvis morphed in my mind from early rock turned Vegas performer to someone with a serious amount of currently trendy hipness. Well, young Elvis anyway. But as much as I dug the Stray Cats or the soundtrack to David Lynch's movies, I guess I never dug it enough to dig deeper, you dig? For me, Elvis remained a marginal, sideline kind of a thing. But I have to face reality. I have to own the fact that I call myself a musician. And somehow I got to be 50 years old without ever once spinning one of the albums that birthed rock and roll. That's pretty much unacceptable. There's an old George Carlin joke that goes something like this. You ever look at your watch, but you still don't know what time it is? So you look at it again, and you still don't know what time it is, and then someone asks you, hey, what time is it? And you have to say, I don't know, and look at your watch again? That's pretty much me listening to this album for the first time, for the second time, and for the third time. I got no new information from hearing this album. None. I mean, there are plenty of songs I'd never heard before, but that doesn't actually matter. Even if I'd never heard the songs, I'd still heard every second of this album before and multiple times, either because it was covered, copied, referenced, parodied, or revived somewhere else. And those copies of copies got to me, even if these originals didn't. Just in terms of how music sounds, the quintet of Elvis, Scotty Moore, Floyd Kramer, Bill Black, and DJ Fontaine created what has got to be some of the most influential music in the 20th century. Now, let's be clear, I'm not saying the best, but like it or not, good or bad, there is no denying the influence. In fact, it's so influential that it seems silly for me to even talk about it. It almost feels like I'm trying to work up some emotion and some personal connections while talking about indoor plumbing or sliced bread. I mean, sure, when it was first invented, big time wow, best thing ever. But now? I mean, it's just part of the day now. It's part of how we live. It's furniture. But if I must point to something tangible that stood out for me while listening to this album the first few times, it would be this. In 1956, there still wasn't a good working definition of what rock and roll was supposed to be. It might be R&B race records, and it might be gospel country. It might be guitar, and it might be piano. Maybe you shouted, maybe you crooned. This album covers a lot of those different bases. As a result, there are definitely songs on this album that today, to my ears, 
are 100% not rock at all. I'm counting on you, for example. That song is as country as the day is long. That is Patsy Cline, Conway Twitty country. That is Grand Ole Opry, BR549 country. Salute! Here's the first thing that I thought of when I first heard Elvis's version of Blue Moon. Remember the end of Mars Attacks when Granny's Slim Whitman album saves the world by killing off all the aliens? That's what that sounded like to me. And Scotty Moore. These guitar solos are such a wild blend of exact and fumbling. There's obviously a ton of skill here, and there's also obviously a ton of, oh no, I can't keep up. And if I think about that for too long, my mind goes down the whole butterfly effect rabbit hole. Scotty Moore's solo on Blue Suede Shoes is probably rock guitar solo number four or five in history, chronologically. What if he went a different route? What if he played more linear than chordal? What if he put in a note or two that was outside the scale? What would music be like today? But since all this music is so familiar already, getting to a deep understanding should be easier than usual. Let's see where this takes me. Now that I have Elvis's first album well in hand, there are two larger questions I find myself dwelling on. The first one is temporal. The recording sessions for this album started in early 1956. That's pretty much 65 years ago. If I were to imagine myself in Sun Studios in 1956, and if I were listening to music that was 65 years old, I'd be listening to a brass band play Sousa Marches or George J. Gaskin sing the songs of Stephen Foster. Day. Most importantly, though, I would be listening to music from a time before there was such a thing as what we today call American music. It was a time before not only rock, but also before jazz and even before blues, though the music that birthed the blues was happening in black communities in the South right about this time. That pretty much means that from the perspective of right now, at the end of 2020, Elvis's first album occurs pretty much at the midpoint of American music. And that brings me to the second big question I've been thinking about because of this album, and that concerns culture. The question I have been asking myself is this. Is there a difference between Pat Boone and Elvis Presley? I mean that seriously, and I mean that in a larger context. The aspects of the phenomenon I'm thinking about break down like this. America undeniably has seen black culture become mainstream culture. It's been happening in fits and starts since 1910, but the birth of rock and roll was a big one. It was where race records of the late 40s and early 50s, when recorded by white artists, became the defining artistic force of the day, the prime mover for America's younger generation. It's what made the boomers boom. So on one hand, let's say hypothetically you're a young white artist that is truly moved by this music to the point where you feel compelled to make your own. Is that a bad thing? What responsibility do you have to the black artists that influence you? But what if it was Elvis, Buddy Holly, or Bill Haley that inspired you to pick up a guitar? Do you still have an obligation to learn where the music came from? On the other hand, if you have a corporate entity trying to find safe white performers to perform safe versions of these dangerous race records so that they can appear safely on television and radio, is that 100% evil or only 75%? Can you make the argument that it exposes more people to the music that they might not have heard otherwise? If Pat Boone definitely counts as the latter corporate example, does Elvis count as the former artistic one? Or is Elvis also ultimately a commercial entity? If the Pat Boone phenomenon is counted as cultural appropriation, is Elvis guilty of the same? Or does he get credit for integration rather than appropriation because his heart was in the right place? Was his heart in the right place? Look, I don't have answers to these questions. And even if I had strongly held opinions, the last thing in the world that I want to be is another white guy trying to explain to the black artistic community how they should interpret the significance of their own work. That's worse than useless. 
But here we are at the end of a year that has been full to busting with hard questions about race. And for what it's worth, I'm doing the best I can. This early rock stuff definitely has its charm, no doubt. But the next time I get the urge for Hound Dog, I'm going to put on Big Mama Thornton. That doesn't mean Elvis wasn't important, but we all need to know where we came from.